Annette, thanks so much for joining us here on Think Like an Asset Manager as we drill down into your world and, and try and understand what drives the decisions that you make when it comes to the investment landscape. There's a lot going on in the world right now. Obviously, Russia, Ukraine, geopolitics impacting the global landscape, driving huge risk aversion uh, across the world. Add to that, you've got inflationary pressure that many say is getting out of hand. Volatile emerging market currencies. And in all of this, you have to, and your teams have to look at the landscape and say, this is the best place to put our clients' money. Where do you start? I think um, what's very important for asset managers is you, all asset managers have a particular style or a set of beliefs. So that's kind of the framework from which you see the world. Um, and I think that it's important over time to stay true to that. So if you are attracted by earnings revisions and growth and momentum, you're going to be looking in a particular area. We are attracted by the less popular areas, the uncovered gems and so on. So maybe we want to start talking a little bit about why we've started seeing a shift to the more value area of the market. And I want to start by saying not all opportunities not, not all stocks that are cheap are value opportunities. It's not that simple at all. But I want to talk a bit more about why growth stocks have been so popular. And you already touched on inflation. So there are three things that influence how people price growth. And the first one is, of course, low interest rates. So when you've got low interest rates, and you've got growth, especially growth like with the tech stocks that are promised well into the future, that's worth a hell of a lot. When interest rates start going up, then people start saying, hang on, um, I, you know, now this growth is actually worth a lot less. So that's the first thing. The second thing that happens is when there's low growth overall, anything that does grow, particularly through the pandemic, digital platforms, etc., gets priced excessively. So that's the second thing that happens. And the third thing that happens is inflation. If there's low inflation, people are prepared to wait for their returns. But when there's higher inflation, people want their money now. They don't want to have the uncertainty of knowing whether that investment's going to grow. So all of this takes place in the background like these big shifting plates. But in the meantime, the popular growth stocks are essentially priced for perfection. We've started seeing little hints of that over the last few months. They can't disappoint. They've got to deliver on that growth. They now have to compete or contend with rising inflation and they've got all these other cheap stocks and they've got rising interest rates. In the meantime, the more cyclical stocks are sitting there super cheap and um, we can talk about some of that a little bit later. They're now starting from a very depressed earning base, seeing a slight normalization. They've all become more efficient because they've gone through lean times. They're sitting on low PEs and a very, very big thing at the moment that's happening is a lot of the basic industries is beginning a supply side story. So when we're looking at the, the boring stocks, the, the, the value stocks, as you say, be very cautious not to think that all cheap stocks are value stocks. Let me take an example. I interviewed Henry Lars, the CEO of Murray and Roberts. The construction industry has been hammered we know this for a long time, it's been out of favor. Henry's sitting there with an order book of, of 60 billion Rand plus. He's confident that despite su supply side constraints, he will be able to deliver on that. Now, if you take the construction industry as a sector, is the tide about to turn for the construction industry? Could you make a, a blanket assumption like that? That's such a great example, Bronwyn. Um, and I think there's a lot of caution one has to have with construction stocks. They're cyclical. Cash flow management is essential. And as we've seen over the past week with um, Wilson Bailey, that, you know, particularly some of the offshore and African ventures have sometimes given these companies quite a lot of grief. But this is such a good example. So Rabix is one of the stocks that we've been looking at for some time. And way back with the, with the World Cup, Rabix's order book was actually smaller than it is now, yet its rating is a lot lower than it is then because of that, um, that unloveness of that sector. So I think here, and as with many of the more 
tricky sectors, our approach is to have a basket approach. So you take a few, you take advantage of a few of these stocks. Now, the interesting thing here is that they are, they're not that many large construction companies left that listed that are listed that you can actually invest in. So that sort of potentially at some point creates, um, you know, quite a nice uplift. So I think one has to look at the company's track record and how they've done, but you're absolutely right. It's an area one has to, one, one can definitely look at. And this is a good example as well, is where the recovery in the share price has started happening way ahead of the actual delivery on the project. So you can't wait until the, all the good news is out there for everyone to see. Isn't the market now more and more difficult to find opportunities in with everybody hunting in the same space? And surely as soon as those cheap undervalued stocks are identified, they very quickly re-rate with the interest in them. So we often ask ourselves that question. We we looking at these, and we were we were way early in this um, a few years ago. We positioned our portfolio a little bit ahead of time, but it's fortunately worked out quite well in the end. So we often ask ourselves, why isn't everybody else seeing this? And investors are actually slower to change than one might think, because the growth stories in the large tech companies, I mean, they're very convincing, and those are fantastic companies, and they are trend makers, I mean, they've changed the world. So I think one can one can definitely um, see why people would be a little bit slower to change. And then, of course, we've seen a lot of people taking their money offshore, especially to the States, and putting the money into income funds. So it's only recently we've started people seeing people reinvesting into risk assets. Um, so I think that's it's really interesting that consumer behavior, investor behavior isn't as logical as one um, might think. So actually, people move once the change has already taken place, once those cheap stocks that are undervalued have run and that, that value has been booked effectively by the early uh, entrance into those plays. Just yeah. finally, the JSE and the opportunity for local, you mentioned offshore, where do we sit with that spectrum? Because there are many, many asset managers that I talk to who say, you've got to look at the international universe. The local universe is just too small. A few comments there. I mean, first of all, you absolutely have to diversify offshore. There is no doubt about that. But we have been, we're not a mega manager. So we've actually been taking advantage of the mid caps for some time and some of the smaller caps. Um, but I think what's also a very interesting sign for me is that we've had quite a few delistings. And the delistings is often the smart money buying, whereas often listings is the smart money selling. So that's been particularly interesting. So there are also ways in which investors in the local market can take advantage of, you know, global trends. I mean, I want to mention one example. I mean, Grindrod shipping and shipping, okay, it is a smaller stock, granted. But that is an example of where our research is the same whether we invest globally or locally. So you'll often find the same type of stocks in our local and our global portfolios. And shipping is really interesting because it's one of those industries where there's a graveyard of investments who've suffered from volatility and the uncertainty around shipping. But it's another very interesting, like construction and a little bit like resources, supply side story. People have stopped building ships, people have stopped building containers, and all of a sudden, there comes a point in a troubled industry, if it can survive, that that supply constraint becomes um, a trigger for pricing and rates to go up. So this is another example of an industry where we've taken a basket approach. We've invested in quite a few of these. And some of these stocks are up threefold in the last year. And not only that, I spoke earlier about paying, you know, paying off earlier on and paying off later in terms of growth versus value. Some of these stocks are paying 20% dividends. So not only are you buying the stock, but as it unfolds, it's kind of selling itself back into your portfolio. So there are, we still think, I mean, I've just mentioned one example that there's a kind of a bridge with, with uh, an offshore trend as well. And of course, the other ones would be resources. But um, the short answer to that question is, we still see plenty of opportunities here, um, but we also have a full waiting offshore.